Welcome to our lecture on arts of Mezzo, Central, and South America to the Spanish conquest. The Mexica people, a formerly nomadic people from a distant homeland they called Aztlan, settled in the Valley of Mexico near present-day Mexico City in the 1200s. So the term Aztec derives from the word Aztlan, and it referred to all those who lived in central Mexico. According to their legend, they saw an eagle perching on a prickly pear cactus growing out of a stone, a sign that their god told them would mark the end of their wandering, so their end of being nomadic people. So they settled in this place that they called Tenochtitlan. They developed this city on an island, and they expanded it beyond its original space by reclaiming land around the island through building artificial canals. When the first Europeans arrived in, in the 1500s, the Western Hemisphere had been inhabited for over 10,000 years by people. The army of the Spanish shoulder Cortez first saw the great Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan in 1519. Aztec religion influenced a lot of their art, and it was based on many gods, a combination of Aztec deities with ancient ones that had long been worshipped in central Mexico. According to the Aztec belief, the gods had created the current era, they also called eras suns, so the gods had created the current sun at the ancient city of Tuantuan. The continued existence of the world depended on human sacrifice because blood was the life force that was owed the gods to keep the cosmos going and time running. Many Mesoamerican peoples believe, at the time believed that the world had been created multiple times before the present era. So most believe they were living in the fourth era. And remember, they also called them suns, S-U-N, so that they were living in the fourth era or sun. However, the Mexica people asserted that they lived in the fifth sun, an era that coincided with their Aztec empire. The calendar stone seen here boldly makes this claim that the Aztecs were making, that they actually lived in the fifth sun or fifth era marked by their own empire. Um, and it references the previous four eras or suns to name the fifth era or sun out of the previous four. So this is a huge stone sculpture. The diameter is over 11 feet. So it's really large and imposing. And it would have originally been seen not on a wall in a museum, but on, um, on the ground. Um, so we have a lot going on here. The central face is really imposing. Um, it combines elements of what Aztecs would have known was the sun god with the protruding tongue of the earth gods. So the tongue is supposed to look like a sacrificial knife. Also look at that central face on either side. There's, there's two round elements. Those are supposed to be ear spools, like the ones the Aztec elites would wear. Okay, so around the central face, there are kind of these four glyphs or four symbols. And each of the four symbols uh, reference the previous four eras. And then if you put all those symbols together, they name the fifth era. So confusingly, they called the fifth era, remember, the fifth sun, the fifth era, the Aztec Empire, they called that the fourth motion. They believed the fifth era, the present era, would be destroyed by a giant earthquake, which they also indicated in this calendar stone, symbolically. Okay, so around those four glyphs, around those four symbols, there's a ba another band with 20 symbols. Those represent the 20 days of the Aztecs' 260-day ritual calendar. So they also had a 365-day lunar solar calendar, but a 260-day ritual calendar. Okay, so then around that, we've got these triangular forms. So those are representing um, the Aztec symbol for the sun. So even though this is called this calendar stone, it's also called the sunstone because it refers to the sun god in the center and its overall shape is round. Um, and we've got those symbols for the sun's rays as well. So while the calendar stone as a whole looks like a sun with its circular shape, as I've shown, it's a really highly symbolic object that really declares the Aztec specific belief that their empire marks the fifth era. 
The army on the Spanish shoulder, Hernán Cortés, arrived at the Aztec capital in 1519. After conquering the Aztecs, the first Spanish viceroy of what the Spanish called New Spain um, was Antonio Mendoza. And a viceroy is just a ruler who's exercising authority in a colony on behalf of their king. So Mendoza was the viceroy of um, New Spain. So Mendoza commissioned a book of drawings by Aztec artists to present to the king of Spain, Charles V, so that Charles V would know about his new subjects that were all the way across the world. So this book of drawings is called the Codex Mendoza, named after the viceroy Mendoza, who commissioned it. He's the patron. Here's one drawing from it. It's the opening page. It is basically supposed to show a map of that Aztec capital city, Tenochtitlan. Um, it's supposed to reference its founding and the Spanish invasion. So let's look more closely. Remember that legend of how um, the capital city Tenochtitlan was founded, that they saw an eagle perched on a prickly pear cactus growing out of a stone? You see that right in the center. That symbol is the symbol of the Aztec capital city, and it really fills the center of the page. You can also see waterways that are dividing the city into four quarters, indicating the lake that's surrounding um, the city. And early leaders of, of the Aztecs are shown sitting in the four quadrants. At the center of the city, Tenochtitlan, um, there was this sacred walled enclosure called the Great Pyramid or the Templo Mayor. The Temple of Mayor was a pyramid and it had two temples on top. Sacrificial victims had to climb the stairs to the top of this pyramid where they were killed, their hearts pulled out as a sacrifice, their bodies rolled down the stairs of the pyramid and then dismembered. And then their heads, their severed heads, were kept on a skull rack in the plaza. And you can see a representation of the skull rack here. So if you look just to the right of um, that eagle in the rightmost quadrant, you'll see a single skull on a rack. And that's supposed to represent a larger skull rack. This is a monumental stone carving of the mother of one of the Mexica gods. Um, and she is a, so her name is Kuatlikwe, and she is associated with the earth and the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. So this sculpture, it's huge. It's over eight feet high, and it would have been really intense to encounter. So Kuatlikwe means she of the serpent skirt, and indeed she wears a skirt of twisted snakes. In this depiction of her, she's been decapitated by some of her children who are jealous of her uh, new child. So she no longer has a head. In place of her head are two serpents. Look at the top there. You see two serpent heads. Um, so their eyes replace her eyes and their teeth replace her teeth. So it's really uh, violent. It refers to both her decapitation, but then these serpents replace her head. Look around her neck, she wears this necklace of human hands, human hearts, and a skull there at the bottom. So she's, it, it implies a lot of violence, human sacrifice, blood, even her own, you know, decapitation. It would have originally been painted with red, white, black, and blue, so even more imposing. After the Spanish conquest, the statue was actually buried. It was considered an inappropriate pagan idol by Spanish Christian invaders. It was rediscovered in 1790 by a historian. The historian drew illustrations of the sculpture and offered his interpretation, but he ultimately reburied it again. She was considered just too frightening. She was again uncovered in the 20th century, and now, finally, um, she's on display in, the Mex in Mexico City's National Museum of Anthropology, one of the most popular um, artworks there. The other great empire um, in this area, in this case in South America, was the Inca Empire. By 1500, the Inca Empire was one of the largest in the world. It extended more than 2,600 miles along the western coast of South America through present-day Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, northern Chile, and Argentina. The capital was Cusco. 
It was a really diverse group of people and languages and cultures, so how do they keep it all together? Well, the Inca relied on religion, an efficient bureaucracy, and various forms of labor taxation. They also were great builders. They built more than 23,000 miles of roads. They used llamas as pack animals to travel, and they had runners, um, a system of runners to communicate messages. Um, they're known for their building, roads and bridges to link the empire, as well as um, their great terraces for agriculture and their mortarless stone structures. Machu Picchu is the ruins of a three square mile Incan city. It sits 8,000 feet above sea level in the Andes Mountains on a ridge between two high peaks. Machu Picchu was a royal estate. So the court went here occasionally. They weren't here all the time. They probably went here when the Cusco winter got too cold and it was a three days walk from Cusco. The site was chosen and situated for its relationship to the landscape, including sites to other mountain peaks, which had long been considered ancestral deities. The site contains housing for elites um, and also for maintenance staff, for commoners to take care of it all. There's also religious shrines here, an observatory, fountains, and terraces. And you can see the terraces on the, the right picture. Um, terraces were a common element of highland agriculture. And so they increased the, the land surface that you can farm. And it also reduced erosion by creating these walled steps down the sides of steep mountains. So every single step could be planted with crops. On the left, you can see a close-up of some of the stone buildings. The stone buildings do still survive, only missing their original thatched roofs. All the buildings are made of granite, a stone that occurs naturally there. So commoners who probably serve the nobles during their ceremonial feasts and political negotiations here, they lived in houses made of irregular stones. Um, and the elite lived, and the temples were made of smooth masonry. And these were all mortarless which is really impressive. It's an excellent example of Incan uh, city and architectural planning too. Everything's designed with the landscape in mind. So for example, walls and plazas frame the views of the surrounding landscape. Um, Machu Picchu had long been known to locals, but it was only found by a Westerner, a Yale archeologist in 1911. He took many items he found there back with him to Yale to study them there. There had been calls by Peru for repatriation for many years, that is the return of the objects, but only in 2010, after a court case, did the Peabody Museum at Yale finally return the items to Peru. Machu Picchu has another issue in addition to, well, the repatriation has been solved, but the issue of tourism, it's become so popular that there's worries of degradation of the site. And the government of Peru recently instituted a ticketing system to cap the number of visitors per day. Among the Inca, textiles of cotton and camelid fibers, and that just means fibers woven from like llamas and alpacas, textiles were an indication of wealth. So I mentioned that the Incas used a form of labor taxation. So one form of labor taxation required the manufacture of fibers and cloths. So women would weave cloths as their labor taxation. So you paid your taxes to the state by spending a certain amount of time doing things for it. In the Andes, textile technologies were developed well before ceramics and finely made textiles from the best materials were objects of high status, considered more valuable than gold or gems. Cloth was even deemed a fitting gift for the gods. Fine garments were actually even draped around statues and burned as sacrificial offerings. The patterns on these cloths, so this would have been worn, and it's a tunic, and the patterns on such tunics had symbolic messages. Um, this tunic from 1500, you can see some squares with um, um, a checkerboard pattern, and that, so the whole tunic is made up of symbols of miniature tunics. So the checkerboard pattern represents patterns on tunics that were worn as military uniforms. And this, um, this was a really high status tunic, and we know that because of that military reference. And also because um, some dyes, like red or blue, were especially prized and reserved for high status textiles. Red dye came from the bodies of small insects, and it took thousands of them to make a small amount of dye. And indigo, blue dyeing required a high level of technical skill. So we know that whoever had this tunic had a lot of wealth, 
in social and political power.